If you ever needed proof that looks can deceive, it's right here in the quiet middle-class suburb of Paris in Southern California. From the outside, this ordinary family home looks like all the others. But its bland exterior hides one of America's worst cases of abuse. Inside, 13 children were chained up, starved and tortured, suffering horrendous mistreatment that went on for years. In court, parents David and Louise Turpin denied any wrongdoing, which means a jury will now decide the truth of this shameful case. It's the picture of suburbia. Identical cookie cutter homes sitting side by side. A real life Pleasantville where working class mums and dads try to achieve the all American dream. Or so you think. Under this roof, in the middle of it all, lived a secret depravity. The worst of human behavior, thinly disguised as one big happy family. When you saw Louise's mugshot on TV, did you recognize her as, as your sister? She looks so different. You know, you can look at someone in their eyes and you can kind of, you know, see a lot into them, you know. And with her, you can, it's just like she was dead inside. And she was kind of had like a smirky grin. That just, that really made me mad. Uh, hello? On the 14th of January, a 17 year old girl rang 911, claiming to have escaped from this house in Paris, California. They are abusive, and two of my sisters are chained up. The 17-year-old said she and her 12 siblings were held captive, subjected to repeated abuse, torture, and starvation by the very people they should have trusted most, their parents, David and Louise Turpin. They began to be tied up, first with ropes, and then using chains and padlocks. What police found behind this closed door is beyond comprehension. Children chained to their beds, others starved to near skin and bone. A torture chamber covered in filth and the stench of rotting animals. The abuse and severe neglect intensified over time and intensified as they moved to California. But according to the person who knew Louise Turpin best, her sister, Teresa Robinette, the horrific truth of this tragic situation can be traced back to a family secret that turned her once naive sibling into a cruel, sadistic psychopath. The circumstances of her childhood are pretty grim. Yeah. How much of an impact do you think that's had on this outcome? In my heart, I feel like a big part of it. You hear people say, you know, sometimes the abused can become the abuser, but I just, I'm so angry with her right now. It's hard for me to give her any excuse. You know, when I think about my mom's house, I can still picture it the way it looked when she was alive. Teresa and her brother, Billy Lambert, rarely come back here to their hometown of Princeton, West Virginia. Despite its natural beauty, it will always be the birthplace of the cycle of abuse that has forever tormented their family. So this is where it all began for you? Yes. Where it all started. And this is the house that you and Louise were brought up in? Yeah. Th this looked like a happy home on the outside, but inside it was miserable. For you then, being here now... It's sad. Does it evoke memories of love or anxiety? Hurt. I don't laugh. Sorry. They must run very deep. I wasn't going to cry. You okay? <laughs> For Teresa, the family home in Princeton is the original House of Horrors. If ever there was any defense of Louise Turpin's future abusive behavior toward her own children, this is it. As little girls, she and Teresa 
were repeatedly sexually assaulted by their grandfather. And worse still, their own mother condoned and encouraged it. Louise went through the same thing we went through with my grandfather, which was probably the darkest, hardest thing for any of us girls to deal with. Your grandfather abusing you? Oh yeah, bad. Uh, my mom would take us to him daily. She was pretty much selling us for money to live on. And that's how it is. I mean, I don't like saying it like that, and it breaks my heart. But it is what it is. You know, I mean, that's what it is. He was taking it out on his granddaughters. Uh, that's almost unbelievable. <laughs> what people don't realize is, you know, like, they, they, I, it's his house of horrors. Like, that's where it all began. The family were devout Pentecostal Christians. And it was here, at this church in the early 1980s, that Louise met David Turpin. She was barely a teen, and he was in his 20s. But the two fell in love, and as soon as she turned 16, Louise seized an opportunity to escape her recurring nightmare at home by running away with David. I used to pick on him all the time and joke with him because he was the geek, the nerd, the, you know, and I was like, well, Louise didn't marry handsome, but she married rich. She is anything she wants. In the space of 15 years, David and Louise had eight children, raising them with military precision and routinely dressing them in uniform clothing. From the outside, the Turpins lived a life of wealth and success. David was a highly paid engineer, and they would fly the family, including brother Billy, to visit them every year. You know, we thought that she was, she had the perfect life, she had the perfect husband, we thought that she was happy. Anytime they wanted something, they did it, you know, because we always saw pictures of them going to Disneyland or going to Las Vegas. I promise, I promise to love you tender. And we're like, well, you kind of have to have money to keep going to Las Vegas. Face to face, I thought they were just a normal, happy family. It's still unclear why, but in 1998, something changed in the Turpin household. Louise and David completely withdrew, not only from their family, but also from the outside world. They were secretly bankrupt, which meant an end to the yearly holidays. And in the first of many strange signs, they began to homeschool all eight of their children. Teresa also noticed the kids didn't look quite right. There was Skype for a while, and we would make comments. I remember making the comment that they were all so little. I remember Louise laughing it off, and well, they're just tall, gonna be tall and lanky, lanky like David, you know. But they didn't look severely malnourished. They looked healthy. They just looked small. And I think she clothed them in a way that we couldn't see. And I think when the questions started, she cut off visual contact and just talked to us on the phone. She was pretty cunning, wasn't she? Yeah. But she went out of her way to keep it going. Yeah, for a long time. Didn't you think it was strange that she was homeschooling all those kids? Yeah, and you know, her excuse to us was, well, the crime rate's always bad or the kids are getting picked on too much and I don't like them feeling, you know, down on their selves. She was committing the biggest crime. She was doing the worst of it, yeah. What no one knew then, but we all know now, is this pretense of at-home education was masking abuse behind closed doors. I don't want to alarm people to people that are homeschooled, but I mean, maybe we could do a little bit more auditing for situations like that. Maybe we can learn that, hey, you know, why is it that people are homeschooling their kids? Is it because it's best for the kids or is it because it's best to keep their secrets? We've been sleeping in there. Okay, why is this door locked? Can you move that out and open the door? Sadly, in America, what happened to the Turpin 13 is not an isolated case. JC Dugard was 11 years old when in 1991, she was abducted by psychopath Philip Garrido. He repeatedly raped her and held her captive for 18 years. The hidden backyard had sheds, tents, and outbuildings where JC and the girls spent most of their lives. Alison Jacobs was the police officer who uncovered Garrido's sadistic crimes and says, just like the Turpins, he got away with the brutality for too long because his victim, JC, became conditioned to her reality. 
And it's frustrating as a law enforcement or anyone if the victims aren't asking for help. Because if they're not asking for help or giving any kind of clue that there's something wrong, how is anybody really to know? With the turbans, it's, it's it, if the kids never said anything was wrong, it, maybe they don't even think anything was wrong with how, how they were growing up. That was their normal, and they were perfectly fine with it. But they're conditioned, aren't they, from day one? Yes, of course. They're conditioned from day one, and they don't know anything different. So why would they ask for help? Coming up, a failed escape. The kid's horrible existence was almost uncovered when the eldest child plucked up the courage to run away. Suspicions raised. Evil is very deceptive. It can look good from a surface if you don't get in there too deep. But why didn't the neighbors act? You two never thought for a moment to pick up the phone? That's next on 60 Minutes.